Welcome dear participants. This module looks at the work of Donna J. Haraway as she explores the embedded sexual politics of the term gender. Haraway is a distinguished professor emerita in the history of consciousness department at the University of California. She has authored numerous foundational books and essays that bring together questions of science and feminism. Haraway was part of an influential cohort of feminist scholars who began working as scientists before turning to the philosophy of science in order to investigate how beliefs about gender shape the production of knowledge about nature in scientific fields. She was awarded the J.T. Bernal Prize, the highest honor given by the Society for Social Studies of Science for Lifetime. For her contributions to the intersection of information technology and feminist theory, Haraway is widely cited in works related to human-computer interaction. Haraway's most famous essay was published in 1985 with the title of A Manifesto for Cyborgs, Science, Technology and Socialist Feminism in the 1980s. Some of her other notable works are Primate Visions, Gender, Race and Nature in the World of Modern Science, Siemens Cyborgs and Women, The Reinvention of Nature and Feminism and Technoscience for which she received the Ludwig Fleck Prize in 1999. This module discusses an essay by Haraway. The title of the essay is Gender for a Marxist Dictionary, The Sexual Politics of a Word. It examines the debates about scientific objectivity in feminist theory and establishes the etymological genealogy of the term gender set apart from sex as a discursive biopolitical category. This essay is an excerpt from the text Simeon Cyborgs and Women, a collection of essays written from 1978 through 1989, a period of complicated political, cultural and epistemological foment within the many feminisms which have appeared in the last decades. This essay examines the recent history of the term sex and gender written for a German Marxist dictionary while exemplifying the textual politics embedded in its discursive use and performativity. The examination of the debates about scientific objectivity in feminist theory, according to Haraway, argues for a transformation of the despised metaphor of organic and technological vision in order to foreground a specific positioning, multiple mediation, partial perspective and therefore a possible allegory for feminist scientific and political knowledge. Haraway explores the politics of grammar and the embedded contestations of linguistic relationality. While contextualizing the history of the term gender, she asserts that grammar is politics by other means. Historically, specific human relations with nature are imagined as genuinely social and actively relational whether they are linguistic, ethical, scientific, political, epistemological or technological. But Haraway comments that our relations with nature might be imagined as social engagement with a being who is neither it, you, thou, he, she nor they in relation to us. The pronouns embedded in sentences about contestations for what may count as nature are themselves political tools expressing hopes, fears and contradictory histories. In the opinion of Haraway, the use of pronouns such as ours as opposed to theirs, us as opposed to them, we as opposed to I denote universalism and deeply entrenched conceptions of humanism. However, Haraway wants us to think in a relational sense as we form one ecosystem of interdependency and our companion species. Rhetorically, Haraway deconstructs the binary oppositions, that is us versus them, cemented by humanist philosophy and 
human exceptionalism. A similar interrogation is essential to understand the gender feminist men's studies in the body discourse so that the othering is comprehensible to us. In the next slide, we have a video. While acknowledging the history of gender, Haraway aims to denounce human exceptionalism and methodological individualism. In this video, Haraway explains two key terms, methodological individualism, which refers to the practice of giving primacy to individual action rather than the group, and human exceptionalism, which refers to the belief that humans only the males are most important of all beings, organisms in the universe. What happens when human exceptionalism and methodological individualism as philosophical uh, research uh, commitments across the disciplines in the Euro-infused knowledge projects, what happens when human exceptionalism and methodological individualism and their stories become literally unthinkable in the best scientific practices of our day. And I would maintain and hope to convince you, if you aren't already, that indeed methodological individualism and human exceptionalism are practically unthinkable um, across the transdisciplinary natural and engineering sciences, the human sciences and arts. And I would like to say something about what I think uh, the consequences might be for imagining and helping to make happen more livable presence as well as more livable futures. In 1983, Nora Rethzel had asked Haraway to write a keyword entry for a new Marxist dictionary. This project aimed at translating the 1985 multi-volume French edition of the Critical Dictionary of Marxism into German language. As Rethzel has suggested, in one of her personal communication, the women's editorial group were going to suggest some keywords which in their opinion are missing. And they also wanted some other keywords to be rewritten because the women do not appear where they should. Haraway feels that this highlights a major arena of feminist struggle. In the canonization of language, politics and historical narratives in publishing practices, women do not appear where they should and therefore Haraway attempts to formulate a genealogy of feminist struggles, especially in the domain of language, culture and the socio-economic division of labor in the society. She begins with language and grammar and notes that sex and gender are distinct categories in the English language. However, this distinction is not evident in other languages. Haraway notes that English, particularly the American English, distinguishes between sex and gender, but this distinction is a site of a struggle in many social arenas. For example, Butler's reconceptualization of gender is a doing rather than an attribute. However, it may be categorized as an attribute of performance in some cases, such as drag culture. Haraway notes that words are not just linguistic markers. They reflect and reiterate history and are livable commodities, changing sense, significations and identities. She also mentions that grammarians did not recognize gender as a separate system with a distinct syntax. She feels that the old hegemonic grammarians of pre-1960s, including the sexologists, had lost control of gender and its diverse and dynamic conceptualizations. On the other hand, English as a language in the USA was marked by race, generation, gender, region, class, education, and political history. In considering the aforementioned, Haraway notes that the late 20th century saw an implosion of gender in sex and language, in biology and syntax, as enabled by Western technoscience and algorithms. She begins this discussion by providing us with keywords such as gender, which is a word in English, gestalt, which is in German, genre, a French word, 
genera is Spanish to linguistically mark multiple trajectories of the term gender. She notes that in English, gender has been used in a very generic sense, whereas in French, German and Spanish, words for gender refer to grammatical and literary categories. It is sometimes used in a very hollow sense. Haraway also traces the etymological roots of the words and says that the modern English and German words gender and gestural closely adhere to concepts of sex, sexuality, sexual difference, generation and gendering, while the French and Spanish do not carry such connotations. For Haraway, the use of gender and sex as interchangeable terms has led to the loss of political history of the term gender. Words which are close to gender find implications in concepts of kinship, race, biological taxonomy, language and nationality, etc. Gender, in Haraway's opinion, is at the heart of constructions and classifications of systems of differences. Complex differentiation and merging of terms for sex and gender are part of the political history of the words. Haraway observes that the medical meanings related to sex accrue to gender in English progressively through the 20th century. Medical, zoological, grammatical and literary meanings have all been contested in modern feminisms. The shared categorical, racial and sexual meanings of gender point to the interwoven modern histories of colonial, racist and sexual oppression in systems of bodily production and inscription and their consequent liberatory and oppositional discourses. Historically, feminist gender theories attempt to articulate oppressions faced by women in the context of cultures while establishing a distinction between sex and gender as more than simple concepts and binary oppositions. Haraway further points out the absence of the female as an active citizen in and from the writings of Marx and Engels. By pointing out the theoretical gaps from Marx to 1990s, she attempts to establish gender as a biopolitical construct. Traditional Marxist approaches did not lead to a political concept of gender for two major reasons in Haraway's analysis. Women considered as an unstable category in between the natural and social in the seminal writings of Marx and Engels was the first reason in her opinion. Secondly, Marx and Engels theorized the economic property relation as the ground of the operation of women in marriage. Haraway comments that it was presented in such a manner that women's subordination could be examined in terms of the capitalist relations of class but not in terms of a specific sexual politics between men and women. The systematic sexual division of labor became the starting point for many Euro-American Marxist feminists in their theories of the sex-gender division of labor. The gender division of labor included the non-historicized labor categories in the works of Marx and Engels, that is, bearing and rearing children, caring for the sick, cooking, housework, and sex work like prostitution. In order to bring gender and women's specific situation to the center of historical materialist analysis. Post-1960s, Western feminists saw a change. It took place in the construction of meanings and technologies of sex and gender, in normalizing liberal, interventionist, therapeutic, empiricist and functionalist life sciences, principally in the United States, including psychology, psychoanalysis, medicine, biology and sociology. Haraway analyzes the concepts and technologies of gender identity through several components. She does a realistic reading of Friot. Reading the sexual somatic and psychopathology by 19th century sexologists, including Havelock Ellis and Kraft Ebbing. She also analyzes the development of biochemical and physiological endocrinology 
from the 1920s, the psychobiology of sex differences growing out of comparative psychology. Proliferating hypothesis of hormonal, chromosomal and neural sexual diamorphism converging in the 1950s and the first gender reassignment surgeries around 1960s. Haraway notes that the second wave feminist politics around biological determinism versus social constructionism and the biopolitics of sex and gender differences occurred within discursive fields pre-structured by the gender identity paradigm crystallized in the 1950s and 60s. However, the feminist gender and sexuality paradigms began to alter as the functionalist and essentializing version of Simone de Boa's 1940s statement that one is not born a woman changed the respective discourses. After summarizing the major developments in the feminist and gender paradigms from 1920s to 1960s, Haraway introduces the concept of identity as possession and the ideals of ownership. Agency as opposed to the biopolitics of control in gender relations. She moves to the changes within and across the gender paradigms during the 70s, 80s and 90s while critiquing biological determinism and sexism prevalent in the field of science and technology. Haraway notes that in the Western discourse, the identity of a person at core has ownership of the self and sometimes of the other as well. She states that, and I quote, possession may be made from various raw materials over time, that is, it may be a cultural production or one may be born with it. She further states that gender identity is such a possession. Not to have property in the self is not to be a subject and so not to have agency. Haraway introduces the phenomenon called as the regulatory fiction which alludes to the Western concepts of gender. She illustrates it with the example of motherhood in the society, the notion that motherhood is natural and fatherhood is cultural. Motherhood is known on site whereas fatherhood is inferred. While motherhood is considered to be innate, fatherhood was something that was acquired in considering the family relations. She elaborates that the modern feminist limitation in theorizing and struggling for the empirical life and social sciences is similar to the inability of Marx and Engels to extricate themselves from the natural sexual division of labor in heterosexuality despite their admirable project of historicizing the family. Sex gender differences discourse exploded in US sociological and psychological literature in the 1970s and 80s. This critical explosion was part of a vigorous political, cultural and scientific contestation over the construction of sex and gender as discursive categories and as emergent historical realities. Feminist writing became prominent in the mid-1970s in this context, primarily in critiquing biological determinism and sexism prevalent in science and technology, especially in biology and medicine. Within the epistemological binary framework of nature and culture and sex and gender, many feminists, including socialist and Marxist feminists, appropriated the sex-gender distinction to argue for the primacy of culture gender over biology, sex in debates in Europe and the United States. Haraway marks that the feminist struggle in the 1970s and 80s aimed at calling out sexism in science, technology and medicine to appropriate the sex gender system as biological sex that is on the basis of genitals and gender performance which is postnatal respectively. Haraway has listed the subjects of these debates in complete detail. But the feminist struggle was not just limited to science and technology. The sex and gender differentiation needed appropriation 
in the politico economic domain as well. And Haraway notes that the social reproduction of labor constituted women as a subject, but what constitutes women as a subject or as a discursive category? In order to answer this question, Haraway refers to the work of Gail Rubin. Particularly her work, The Traffic in Women, Notes on the Political Economy of Sex and the critiques of her work on sex and gender system to elaborate on the deep structures of biopolitics of gender and commodification of women. We have already discussed Gail Rubin in detail in the fourth week. However, in this section we will look at some select critiques as mentioned by Haraway. Haraway elaborates on the critiques and use of Rubin's system to highlight that we might have succeeded in providing a separate genealogy of gender. However, we have failed to dehegemonize it as it is produced, appropriated and differentiated by the white discourse. As we have discussed in earlier weeks, Rubin elaborated on the domestication of women in which human females were tagged as the raw materials for the social production and reproduction of women through the exchange systems of kinship controlled by men in the institution of human culture. Rubin defined the sex gender system as a system of social relations and control that reformulated the biological sex into products of human activity and intervention. According to Haraway, Gale applied a Marxian analysis of sex gender systems as products of human activity which are changeable through political struggle for survival. Citing Rubin's research as support, Haraway has suggested that obligatory heterosexuality is central to the operation of women. Haraway reads the Marxist analysis of sex gender system to various theorizations by Audre Lorde, Heathy Hartman, Iris Young, Teresa de Lauretis and some other critics who have built on Rubin's sex gender system and contributed to the reconstitution of women as a self-sustaining category and not as appropriated products by men. There have been several uses as well as criticisms of Rubin's sex gender system. Haraway notes that the system talks about a westernized sense of the term subject, but does it refer to being white only? As Audre Lorde puts it, being women together was not enough, we were different. And this assertion can be extended to reading not only just the racialized, but also the trans women. Haraway enumerates diverse theorizations post Rubin's sex gender system. The select theorists mentioned here in this context present a comparative analysis of system of oppression and gendered or sexual division of labor as a biopolitical tool contributing to the marginalization of women and of the queer. Haraway refers to Heidi Hartman. Hartman insisted that patriarchy was not simply an ideology but a material system that was able to create interdependence and solidarity among men to enable them to dominate women. Iris Young has criticized the dual systems approach to capital and patriarchy. Young argued that patriarchal relations were internally related to production relations as a whole such that a focus on the gender division of labor could reveal the dynamics of a single system of oppression. Nancy Hartstock highlighted the categories that Marxism had been unable to historicize. Firstly, women's senseless labor in the making of human beings through childbearing and raising. And secondly, women's nurturing and subsistence labor of all kinds. However, Hartstock rejected the terminology of the gender division of labor in favor of the sexual division of labor in order to emphasize the bodily dimensions of women's activities. Here Haraway notes that the term labor 
was taken as the extensions in Marx's feminist meanings of reproduction to theorize women's agency over the body and status as subjects in history. By using the sex gender system, Jeffrey Escoffier argued for a need to theorize the emergence and limitations of political subjectivity while incorporating sexual identities in gay movements. Haraway's theorizations on the cyborg in the feminist discourse also contributed to a deeper understanding of women as a Marxist feminist subject. Her 1985 manifesto for cyborgs addressed to women's positionings in multinational science and technology mediated social, cultural and technical systems. We will discuss it in detail in the upcoming week. Catherine McKinnon has argued that sexuality is to feminism what work is to Marxism, that which is most one's own yet most taken away. Sexuality according to Haraway is that social process which creates, organizes, expresses and directs desire, creating the social beings we know as women and men as their relations create society. As the organized expropriation of the work of some for the benefit of others define a class, that is workers. The organized expropriation of the sexuality of some for the use of others defines the sex or women. In another analysis of gender, D. Loretis has defined gender as a social construction of women and men. Haraway presents these critical accounts to demonstrate women's lived realities and collective struggle as an entry on gender for the Marxist dictionary. She presents these theorizations to showcase the political subjectivities inherited by women as a category, gender as a category, apart from sexuality and sex. However, she indebts these approaches to Marxism as the absence of women in the public domain. Haraway also questions the universalizing power of Rubin's sex gender system. And she asks that since women were oppressed by the exchange of women through kinship, what can be said about the oppression caused by men to women outside the institution of kinship? Haraway asks as what constitutes women as a subject outside the private domain outside the household, marriage, family relations and most importantly the white discourse. Using Rubin's sex and gender systems as a theoretical construction or as a critique, Haraway presents these arguments to foreground multiple collective yet distinct subjectivities. In order to showcase the complexities of political construction of the intertwined nature of feminism, gender and sexualities and embedded and embodied subjectivities. The white discourse does not fulfill the gender discourse as it produces a rather orientalist, racist and colonialist discourse. Furthermore, according to Haraway, in the construction of sex identities as complex and contested political constructions in critical theory, a number of hierarchical differences such as language, race, nationality, gender, class, sexual orientation, etc. are intertwined. Haraway feels that the theories of the social positioning of women ground and organize generic feminist theory. Within it, diverse concepts structure the field of feminist discourse as it decodes what counts as a woman within as well as outside feminism. She has listed various diverse concepts, including the house of difference of Lord, moving to the idea of the inappropriated other propounded by Trin. Feminist deconstructions of the subject have been crucial in understanding gender and sex. The political accounts of their struggle, such as feminist theories of gendered racial subjectivities, the LGBTQIA plus subjectivities have reformed the claims on action, knowledge and belief systems to produce change. 
Haraway notes that gender is grammatically about denoting differences and not creating differentiation and subsequently discrimination. Hence, gender in the feminist interventions was developed as a category to explore what counts as a woman to problematize the previously taken for granted. She also claims that if we follow Simone de Boa's assertion that one is not born a woman with all the consequences of that insight, then we will consequently come to an understanding that a woman as a category is a personal yet socially politically constituted subject. This social reconstitution for Haraway is at the heart of feminist sex and gender politics. Finally, Haraway concludes by suggesting that the political and explanatory power of the social category of gender depends upon historicizing the categories of sex, flesh, body, biology, race and nature. To conclude, we can say that Haraway pivots between the languages, construction of gender and sex, theories of gender and the intersections of identity. These constructed embodiments must take into account the inherent pluralities. Haraway takes this discussion further in her explications of the cyborg and reforming the subject which will be taken up in the upcoming lectures. In the next module, we will look at the intersection of the biopolitics of the gendered bodies, video games and the narratives of control. Thank you.